if you've been through enough life uh, and had life beat you around a bit and punch you in the face, then you're naturally going to be, you could be more empathetic. Um, if you don't have that, it's really about asking questions, goes into the curious piece, asking questions, digging deep and getting in the habit of asking questions and the habit of getting more and more curious. And then as you do that, you will hear things that will hopefully trigger you to want to solve those problems. This is Outside Sales Talk, the best podcast for outside salespeople. I'm your host, Steve Benson, and we're here to chat with the world's top sales experts so that you can get their best sales tactics to level up your game. Welcome back to Outside Sales Talk. Today, we are going to be talking about powerful, authentic persuasion tactics to close your next deal. We have Jason Cutter with us, and uh, Jason is a, is a sales success architect, consultant, trainer, coach, author, and podcaster. He's the CEO and founder of Cutter Consulting Group and the author of Selling with Authentic Persuasion. He's also the host of the Sales Experience Podcast, where each weekday he shares valuable tips and lessons to help salespeople create a sales experience that will turn prospects into customers. Jason, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Steve. I, uh, I appreciate that intro. Sounds, uh, sounds really cool when you put it that way and put it all together. <laughs> That's the goal, you know, we, we, short and sweet. Um, so you, you wrote a book called Selling with Authentic Persuasion. What does the term authentic persuasion mean? Uh, so for me, and obviously most people are familiar with those two terms, putting them together, you know, is obviously not a, a necessarily a new concept. Uh, for me, it's the combining of the authentic piece, which is who you are, what makes you valuable uh, and powerful and strong in a sales role, let's say. Um, also addressing your fears, the self-awareness, and who, what makes you, you, uh, especially in terms of sales relative to not trying to be somebody else or pretending to be somebody else, but just using who you are to your maximum effect. And then the persuasion piece is all about being a professional and seeing it as your duty and responsibility to move people forward if they're a good fit and then having a framework for that. Uh, the subtitle for the book is Transform from Order Taker to Quota Breaker. And what I see a lot is that there's a, a lot of people in a sales role are actually operating more like order takers because they're afraid of manipulating or tricking people or having to lie to people to be successful. Um, and for me, I feel that there's a super powerful area in the middle which is the authentic persuasion piece. And how does this type of selling differ from traditional sales methods? How, how, what, what differentiates it? Well, so if we look at really traditional, what we think of classic sales mode and classic sales models, it's really about getting someone to buy, not necessarily for their reasons, but for yours. It's about the power being in the knowledge and the data and you know, the features and the benefits. Um, it's about, you know, mirroring can be used in a good way, but it's also about, you know, trying to be that salesperson that you think they want to be or need to be, um, you know, and, and classic is really about the pushy side and doing it for your own reasons versus what do you need as a prospect? What are you looking for? What would help you? And then if I see that, then I'm going to do it. And it's really, a lot of it just comes down to the intentions behind it being like a long-term success for the other person. And at the same time, not a, not a lose win, uh, because that's what happens a lot with order takers, which is they want the other person to win so much, they're willing to just lose on their end. So how can salespeople form an authentic relationship with their prospects and customers? I think it takes two parts. One is you actually have to care about people. So that helps. Uh, there's a lot of people who enter in sales and they don't actually care. They pretend to care. And I you know, work in a realm with a lot of call centers and a lot of people in sales where as soon as they're out of that meeting or they hang up the phone, everything that comes out of their mouth is saying that they just don't care. Like they literally think that person is dumb, but they're going to sell to them anyway. Um, so the first part is actually caring. And then the second part is just being genuinely and deeply curious about the other person. If there's one trait that I've learned in my own career and with the people I've had on the podcast is when you're curious, then you're going to dig deep into what makes the other person tick, what they need. And if you combine that with the caring and the empathy, then you're serving them with sales 
And instead of like doing something to them, you're doing something for them and with them. How, okay, so how, what are some things that if you're a salesperson, you can do to enhance this? Like how can you make yourself care more? How can you, how can you become more curious? How, is, there, is there a thought process or a mental process or exercise that you can do to kind of uh, practice or enhance this to build your authenticity? The caring part, it usually comes down to going through enough life experiences where you understand that everybody is going through something and that you want to get your prospect to a better place. And again, it doesn't matter what you're selling. You could be selling knives. You could be selling SaaS platforms. Like it doesn't matter. Your goal is, is the other person. If you've been through enough life uh, and had life beat you around a bit and punch you in the face, then you're naturally going to be, you could be more empathetic. Um, if you don't have that, it's really about asking questions, goes into the curious piece, asking questions, digging deep and getting in the habit of asking questions and the habit of getting more and more curious. And then as you do that, you will hear things that will hopefully trigger you to want to solve those problems with your product or service or, you know, by referring them somewhere else. Yeah, we can all we can all develop our empathy skills and become more empathetic. It's only going to make us a better salesperson. And I and I like the idea that you just laid out there, where it's almost like uh, it's building on itself in a positive cycle, right? So it's like you if you have curiosity and ask questions, it causes you to see things better from the other person's perspective, become more empathetic, which probably leads to more curiosity and more asking questions. So it's almost a a positive cycle of curiosity and empathy that can make you a greater salesperson and, uh, and a more authentic salesperson. Yeah. That. And I think one of the things, especially for new salespeople entering the market, um, especially if they're younger and they just haven't had a lot of life experience, it's not about age. It's usually just about like experiences in life that kind of you have to go through. Um, but one of the things is I always recommend people is they, they're going to be more effective if they're actually a customer of whatever they're selling. So if you're selling something and you've never used it or never been challenged by the situation that you're trying to solve for the other person, it's going to be hard for you to relate to them, right? Like if you're selling really expensive vacuum cleaners and you've never vacuumed, you don't care, you don't have a house, you still live with your parents, it's going to be a challenge for you to convey that or to understand someone else's problems. If you've been there, right? Like then it's so much easier to sell because you can relate, right? And you understand what the situation is. Um, and if you can't relate going into it, become a customer if you can, and then get in their shoes and it'll help you sell better. So how can a salesperson say no to a, a prospect or a customer? What are, what are some thoughts that you have there? What, when is it appropriate to say no? When do they need to say no? And, and how do they do it? I think the answer, the first one is that when you say no is when it's not a good fit, right? They have problem X, you only have solution Y. It's not a good fit. And, and not just not a good fit right in the moment, but you know long-term. You know it's not the right thing for them long-term and they should go another route. Um, Whenever that's the situation, then it's really your duty and obligation to say no. The nice thing is that when you tell them no, it will blow their mind um, because they're not expecting it. Salespeople don't say no. Salespeople only push for the yes, right? That's what everyone's taught. Um, and so to say no will really throw off that prospect. How do you do it is really a function of after you've done your discovery or your probing questions or whatever that, you know, investigative curious phases, then you get to the point where you're like, based on what you told me, here's what you're looking for. Here's what would help you. And here's, and what I always tell them is, let me tell you, I don't think it's a good fit. I don't think what I have is something that would help you. And let me tell you why. And then I explain what I actually do and what I have to offer and who it's a good fit for, explain why it's not a good fit, and then give them the recommendation of where they go. Also keep in mind that the way that I just said that, that means that I didn't give them my long monologue and my long sales pitch prior to asking my discovery questions. I got to give them some kind of elevator pitch to get it going, but I'm not reading from the brochure prior to knowing if it's a good fit or not. Um, and if it's not, then I'm just going to point them in the right direction. And depending on what you're selling, also leverage that into referrals. So I have a chapter in the book where it's all about saying no and the power of that. When you tell somebody no, 
they're going to want to tell all their friends and family about you because they might be a better fit and they feel like they can trust you because you're like an actual honest salesperson. So important. Um, why, why would you say it's important for salespeople to know their intention when they, when they start a conversation with a prospect? you know, it all comes down to intention. Like is your intention to help other people succeed with your product or service or just in general uh, versus, you know, a lot of people get into sales because they just see the dollar signs. They see it in, you know, boiler room, Wolf of Wall Street, uh, Mad Men type of framework where they go, yeah, I want that. Even though none of those turn out well for anybody, but you know, they, they, they watch the first parts. And so, you know, what is your intention? Because if your intention is to help other people and you see sales as a profession that you can do and as a service to other people, then that will come through in your conversations. The prospects will pick up on that. Um, it also helps overcome any issues when they think that you're pushing them too hard. If your intentions are clear that you want to help them, then it's such a different place and it affects what you say and then also how they react. So what, what are some good intentions? So helping the customer you mentioned, what, 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 are the, what are some good intentions that a salesperson can, can focus on or make their reason for to, to, that they kind of wrap their head around when they're trying to make a sale? I think the biggest one is just coming from a place of both service and abundance. And it, it sounds weird sometimes, right? Like if we're talking about sales, you should be of service. They think, okay, well, this is, this is not like a nonprofit. I'm not, you know, trying to do charity work. I'm trying to make a good living. And I agree. And I think you can do both when you serve other people and you provide value to them when you're selling something that could help them sky's the limit on the value. And the more effective you are at helping people and being of value to them, whatever, again, it could be knives, it could be vacuum cleaners, it could be, you know, solar panels. Uh, the more value you can create for other people, the more you're going to get paid. It's just how that works. Um, so the intention is to serve and then also abundance coming from the place of there's 8 billion people on the planet. You don't need all of them. How many do you really need to be successful in your selling career? Uh, and then based on that, do the math. You don't need to push everybody. And so there's more than enough people out there for all of us to help and serve and sell to. And the other thing is, is to help people understand it too, is think about, you know, if somebody were to sell to your grandma or to your best friend or to your parents, how would you want them to do it? How would you want them to treat them? And how would you want them to handle the sales conversation? Uh, and what intention, and that's usually the best way to act on your own end. So when you say abundance, you mean there's lots of people I could be selling to, and so I want to make sure that if I'm selling to some, I, I can say no to this to this sale because there are a lot of other people that I could be selling to, which is kind of a different message than I think, you know, a lot of sales teams, um, different philosophy than a lot of sales teams adhere to which would be, you know, let's convert as many of our leads as possible. You're saying more, uh, it's an abundant world. We should say no to people that aren't a great fit for us and point them in the right direction. And, uh, and it's fine because it's an abundant world. And long-term, that'll be better for everyone, including, including us, even though short-term, it might cost us some deals. Yes, with a very strong caveat that you also have to be careful because I see salespeople uh, who fall into the abundance trap, which is, hey, there's so many people out there, it will happen, you know, I'll find the right people. And it's kind of, you know, the, the self-help abundance mode where, you know, if I just sit on the couch and think happy thoughts and meditate, like it's all just gonna come to me. Like, no, it still takes a lot of action. And so it, the abundance part really also comes into play when you're having conversations, which is, I want to push you forward to buy if it's a clear, you know, it's a clear yes, like you should buy from me. And I'm doing it because I want to help you, not because I'm desperate, not because of commission, bro. So it's not necessarily a, you know, there's plenty of people out there and I don't have to push you forward. It's more of why am I pushing you forward? I'm pushing you forward because it's the best thing for you. At the end of the day, they don't need it. And so from a management perspective, it's always a fine line because salespeople sometimes will lean too hard on abundance and say, you know, well, what happened with them? Oh, they had to think about it. So I'm just going to move on to the next one because, it, you know, it wasn't a clear yes. But it could have been a clear yes if you were better at what you did 
and came from a place of abundance with the right intention. So it's a, it, sometimes it's a dangerous game where I see salespeople lean too hard on, let's just hope. You said something that I've, I, I've heard before and think, think is so funny, commission breath. I love <laughs> it's true, right? And, and really, if you, if you relate it to, you know, I, I, I look at sales in the same way of courtship and dating. Um, you know, it, when somebody is desperately single, and desperately trying to ask somebody out on a date or get somebody to date them, uh, it's very unappealing. And it comes across a different way than somebody who wants to genuinely learn about the other person and see if it's a good fit, maybe go on a date and see where it's gonna go to versus you know, 2 a.m. at the bar and they don't wanna go home alone. It's just this terrible like, you know, kind of attack. And I feel that's what salespeople do a lot. Absolutely. Um... What role does listening play in authentic persuasion? It's, it's so important in empathy, and so I feel like the two are, are closely related here. What, what would you say, how does list, what role does listening play, and, and how can you be a better listener to, uh, to authentically persuade better? I think listening is all of it um, in those sales conversations. The framework that I teach is you know, it's rapport, and then it's empathy trust hope and urgency so those five parts of a sales success fundamental which is you know present in every sales conversation in some in that order but in some uh, you know at some rate for each so thing again, empathy selling. rapport yeah. hope and urgency rapport empathy trust hope urgency ref you i've never been able to get it to spell anything else because those words are just so perfect like i can't come up with a different acronym um so rapport, empathy, trust, hope, and urgency. And you've got to do them in, or, in that order. Um, you've got to do them completely. If you go straight to urgency, you just sound like a desperate salesperson. Um, if you're just about hope, then it sounds like a hype man. Um, if you spend all your time in rapport, like you're just going to be in the friend zone and it's not going to work. So it's really that problem. And again, you can apply this to literally any sales process, any sales cycle, any conversation. Um, but the empathy part is that discovery. It's the asking questions. And the reason why that builds empathy is that people uh, don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And people generally feel like you care about them when you listen, when you ask questions and then you listen. Um, in general, except for the demo presentation of a sale, salespeople should be talking a third of the time prospects should be talking two thirds of the time. And so then that what means is you're listening twice as much. And my grandma used to say, you know, two ears, one mouth, listen twice as much as you talk. That's why we're all built that way. But most people don't do that. And so you ask questions, you listen. Um, and how do you, how do you get that? How do you do that successfully? The key is, is most people listen. They're, when they're not talking, they're thinking about what they're gonna say next. And they're thinking about their next strategy. Instead, where you want to get to in your sales career is just like any conversation, which is I ask a question, I'm actually listening, and I'm not thinking about what I'm going to say next or strategizing or thinking about my next part of the pitch. I'm just listening, and then I'm going to respond. And that takes a lot of self-awareness, confidence, and just trust that you know what you're talking about. Like this conversation here, right? Like you're asking me questions. I'm not thinking about you know, what the next question is, what I'm going to say next. We're just going back and forth. Um, and that's really where you want to get to because then it's authentic conversation. You can show them empathy because you don't have to talk all the time. Yeah, I think it's important that people are comfortable taking pauses, you know, like you, you almost have to pause and think if you if you're really listening to someone and it almost shows that you're really listening. Like if you follow up with the next question on your list and you're, you know, as soon as someone start, stops talking in a, in a, in a sales call, they can tell you you're not really listening. It's almost like you, you, you need to process what they're saying and give yourself, be, allow yourself that time to process. And they, and they kind of, ex, they expect it. It's a normal conversation, right? They expect you to have to think and for a second and kind of, you know, ask them the next question about the thing that they just said and, and, and make it a natural conversation. Too many people are, are too scripted, I think. I think it's too scripted and I'll tell you just I know on personal relationships so outside of sales and business I feel like a lot of people just don't listen just in general and I don't know if you can blame social media online I mean this is we're talking pre-pandemic but I just feel like 
when you're having conversations with people, people don't care. Like they, they want to talk about their own thing. They're not asking questions. When you interact with somebody who asks you a bunch of questions and actually seems like they care about your answers and want to get to know you, it feels amazing. It also feels weird because it's not as common, I feel like, as it used to be. When you do that with your prospects and you're that one who listens, literally you can do the whole conversation without having to pitch anything and they will trust you, they think you care, and then whatever you say after that point, they'll go along with because they trust you. And why? Because you literally just stayed quiet and then responded appropriately. Could we could we go over a few of these like like the things that you like key quotes that you would say to and key things that you would do to build or like I see the, the I, I can kind of visualize the, the flow between these things you're talking about rapport to empathy yeah. to trust to hope to urgency like um, but there are some hiccups in there that I that I, I that, it's, that I'm not sure how you like creating urgency while not ruining the trust and like how. Could you just kind of walk through that that talk path, like, oh, to build rapport, these are some key things to keep in mind. To, you know, on the empathy side, it's you know, this yep. listening, et cetera. On trust, you know, could you just kind of kind of take us take take the take us through your thoughts there? Sure. So the the rapport side, most people are familiar with. Um, the goal of rapport is to just to get people warmed up, get the conversation going, finding some common things are good. This is what I teach though a lot is to make it authentic because there's a lot of people who build rapport and they're doing it from this fake and phony surface place instead of actually caring and actually wanting to getting to know and then having common ground. The best way to build rapport is to be interested in people because you want them to be interested in you and the best way to be interesting is to be interested. So the key is, is to just be interested in the other person, not sales, not their problem, not how you can sell them, just them as a person. Like, tell me about you. Like, you know, how's your day? Just the, the general stuff that you would do rapport. The key is then to build it and be authentic and be real. Just be a human. Like literally that's what I tell them. You know, when in doubt, just be a human. A, do the opposite of what you think a salesperson should have to do. And then B, just be a human. If you do that in the rapport part, it's great. But Key is though, is to do the right amount of rapport for whatever you're selling and the other person needs. Cause some people need lots of rapport to warm up. Some people instantly, best friends, let's go, let's have the conversation. And so you gotta be careful not to be like, I've gotta do four minutes of rapport and then I've gotta do this. Like you, you gotta be able to flow. And then you got to transition out of it and you got to go into the empathy, which would be the discovery part, right? And transitions are so important. This is where a lot of salespeople fail is to make that transition, which is, Hey, I appreciate you sharing all that information. Now the next part is I want to get to understand your situation um, and what you're dealing with now. And I want to ask you some questions, try to figure out if what we're, what I have available would be a good fit for you. Um, so what I want to do is ask you some questions and then just go into your questions, right? And set it up, tell them why you're going to ask them what the purpose is, what you're hoping to find, you know, hey, this is not a good fit for everybody. So I want to ask questions before wasting any more of your time. Boom, go into the next, go into your next part. As far as the rest goes, really, I'm telling you, it all hinges on the question asking, discovery, probing section. When you're talking about the trust, when you're talking about the hope, when you're talking about the urgency, it all comes on that. Um, and when you do the rapport and the empathy, what I found is that builds trust. You don't ever ask for trust. You don't say, hey, you can trust me. Um, the trust part is generally maybe more about your company, social proof, third party testimonials, um, some of that stuff. And then the hope is all about how you're going to solve their problem. But again, the only way you can know that and be specific and strategic is when you ask questions and you know their problem. They have this problem. You can solve it. Hey, I've got good news for you. Based on what you told me, this is why I think it's a good fit. This would help you with insert, you know, whatever it is that you're helping with and what you're selling. So that's the hope part where it's, it's not just, I've got a solution that everyone will love. It's you've got this situation, right? You've, you, you, you're paying too much for your electrical bills. I can help you with solar panels based on what you told me. This is a home run. That's great. Like you're going to save this much money. It's fantastic. Then the urgency piece is you've got to know, you've got to ask the questions. You've got to uncover their information. And then the urgency is about why they need to do this right now. 
Not why you think they should do right now, not why because you have end of quarter bonus that you've got to hit or whatever that is, but like why they need it. So they need these solar panels as soon as possible because they're paying $500 a month in electricity and they could cut their bill down to $100 a month, right? Like when's the time to start saving money? It's right now. But you can only do that and be powerful with it in persuasion if you know the answer, which is they're here, they could be here, now the time is right now. Now, if you're a sales manager or a sales operations person, what can you do to enable your field sales team to have, to, to do this workflow better? Um, you know, they're go, going from, is it, is it empathy building exercises? Is it supporting them with like, here are some great discovery questions, it, you know, on the, is it helping them create urgency with, giving them ROI calculators or tools to show what the customer, how much, what the customer will benefit and uh, in terms of dollars over the next month, quarter, year from, from taking this action, what would, what do you, rec do you have any specific rec recommendations for those types of people who are enabling the sales force to do better? Uh, I would say all of those things you said. I, I generally what I'll do with sales teams that I'm working with that are struggling is we'll work backwards, which is let's look at what your solution does for the end user, right? So I'll work with some SaaS companies where they're selling software as a service and they're selling it to marketing managers. And the teams I'm working with, they've never been a marketing manager. They don't even know what a marketing manager really does. They just know what they're selling to. And it's like, okay, let's understand the problems and the challenges and the stresses of that person. And then let's work backwards and be like, okay, so here's the questions you would ask. Like, here's the end result we wanna to get to, and then fill in those gaps. So like you said, the ROI calculator, it could be the discovery questions, it's the practicing, um, you know, it's, it's getting enough things on deck, which is like testimonials, third party stories, social proof, having that in the toolbox, and then really helping the team understand, like, here is the end result. Here's what we want. Here's who it's a good fit for. Here's what it means to them. Now, here's the framework, go through these stages and then get there. And then the rest of it's the tools in the toolbox. And then also helping them understand like every conversation will be different. Don't try to put it in the same process. Like I'm a big one on scripts. Some of it should be scripted like transitions. Then the rest of it, you've just got to adapt. That's why we're using salespeople and not robots. And they can't just order it online. If they could, they wouldn't need you. That's right. Yeah. yeah. As you were talking, I was reminded of uh, one of my best sales reps. Um, this guy that he was, a, he was a field salesperson for 20 years. And so you know, when he started, you know, working at Badger and selling Badger software, he just picked it up right away. And uh, I remember when I was you know, first sitting with him when he was first here and I was like, man, you, you really get this stuff. And he's like, well, yeah, I mean, I've been doing this for 20 years. So I've always had this problem. So <laughs> like, yeah, it's, it's an interesting, it's an interesting question. I guess, could, can you look to hire salespeople to your team who would have otherwise been the end user of your product? Maybe sometimes, maybe sometimes not, but that's Some, sometimes you can, uh, they always make the best salespeople, somebody who's empathetic, who's been there. Uh, many times in, in my career, I have managed, sold and then managed like debt relief services. And there's been periods in my life where I've been in like really, really deep debt. Um, it makes me great at the sales side because I empathize like crazy. I know what it's like to use your debit card and not be able to get groceries because it's literally that is everything is maxed out. Um, and then to recover from that, like I get it. And so it, it, my conversations with people come from a totally different thing because I get it. And so that's where a lot of salespeople, they just, they're, they haven't walked enough miles in their prospective customer shoes. And if you can do that part, the rest of it's easy because the rest of it's just a conversation to get there. And, and one thing you said, you, you, you talked about order taker salespeople. How would you define an order taker and what's your advice for how a salesperson like this could take their, uh, their career to a higher level? You know, for... Me, I use the term order taker as somebody who is just underperforming, not closing enough sales, and generally is not proactive in the sales process and the persuasion process. 
Uh, sometimes they're afraid of confrontation. Sometimes they're afraid of controlling. Generally what happens, again, it's, it's, it's one of a couple different buckets. One is they just never receive training. They don't have a good manager, coach, or leader. That Nobody ever showed them how to do it. When I got into sales, no one showed me how to sell. And I had to, it was all self-taught. Uh, I mean, I've actually never worked at a company where they've provided me any sales training, like on actual sales skills. Um, I've always just had to figure it out or I'm the one building it. <clears throat> and so um, that's one cause of sale, uh, order takers. Another one is that as a customer, they don't like pushy, manipulative, controlling type salespeople. And so they end up defaulting to the opposite because the golden rule, no one wants to be a hypocrite. So I wouldn't want to push you if I don't like being pushed, right? If I go to a car lot and I hate that feeling when I'm getting like pushed by a salesperson and I feel like, hey, they won't let me off the lot until I talk to the manager and then this and that, of course, I'm not going to do that to other people. And so that kind of causes that. And the key is, is to get them to shift out of that and see it as their, their duty and their responsibility. So in your book, Selling with Authentic Persuasion, you talked about intangibles a lot, like the, the intangibles of a successful sales career. Yeah. Um, what, what are the intangibles of a successful sales career and uh, why do they matter? So I'll start with the why they matter. Um, so intangibles, if anyone listening to this is a sports fan, then you know the intangibles are those little things that don't end up on the scoreboard um, when somebody's playing in sports, right? So I'm more of a basketball fan than anything else. Intangibles are like the hustle plays and diving for a basketball and, and just being annoying to the other team such that it gets in their head, right? It's these things that don't show up on the stats that will never be tracked in any way. And intangibles to me are the difference maker when one professional is playing against another professional and it gives them that edge. Keep in mind, if you're selling, it's you as a professional against the ultimate professional, which is the human mind and the part of the mind in particular, which is the amygdala, which is attributed to wanting to keep us safe. And it still thinks it's in primal survival mode, right? That part of our brain, and we all have it, still thinks it's on the planes. Uh, from 10,000 years ago or in a cave from X thousands of years ago and picking the wrong berry could kill you or there might be a saber tooth tiger around every corner. And so your prospect's biggest fear is change. The one thing they're afraid of ultimately hands down across the board is change because change equals death in our primitive parts of our brain. So the intangibles help you, the professional, get the slight edge over the other professional, which is your prospect. Um, and so some of the intangibles, one of them that I see a lot with order takers and usually the telltale sign is that they pause and not the pausing you're talking about earlier, which is conversational pausing. And you know, you said something insightful and I'm thinking about it and I'm figuring out you know, what to do with that and I'm processing, that's one thing. Uh, the pausing I'm referring to is I'm going through my process. I'm going through, let's say my ex explanation of what I'm selling. You interrupt me with an objection. You ask me a question. Is there a fee? And I say, of, yes, there is a fee. And then I pause and I leave this gap because it's polite. You asked me a question. I answered it. I want to make sure that you have the space to answer, ask more questions. And so I leave this death gap, uh, this pause. And then what happens? Nature doesn't like a vacuum. You, Mr. Prospect, who's scared, that's why you asked your question, is going to hit me with another question. I'm gonna pause, I'm gonna answer, I'm gonna pause, you're gonna punch me again. And I call it a death by a thousand punches um, because the prospect is in control because the salesperson is not. When you pause, then you're not in control. And so that's just one of the intangibles where if you fix that, if you overcome that, and instead of pausing, you do other things, which I talk about in the book, um, you will significantly improve your conversations because you're maintaining control. Yeah, when one trick I've always used for that is to redirect back to what you're talking about. So if you're, you know, classic, like the objection you just brought up, if it was a sales, a price objection and the, the prospect was like, you know, Oh, let's talk. About, you wanted to talk about the price. And right. I, I would, you, know, you can redirect back. You can say, yeah, you know, the, the, there's definitely a cost and, and here's the price. And, um, and the, the reason the price is, is that, and it is more expensive than some of our competitors, but um, we, uh, we have a lot more value that we bring to the table than a lot of our competitors. Like, uh, you know, we, we, uh, we, you're going you're gonna to realize a, a return on investment far quicker and, uh, and be way better off. 
let me show you how. And that it's that last part that is so important because it's like it's almost rather than waiting for them to respond to right. that stuff that you just said, you you redirect back to the the process that you're taking them through and where you're going to show them all the different value and all the different differentiators, but it can kind of put that, it can bring up that conversation about, or that objection and, and it can kind of address it, but then put it on pause for later because you want to get through your process and wh where you'll often cover things of that nature. But that's a, a, that let me show you how is a way to take it back. Yeah, and so that's one great strategy. And the only thing I would add to that is depending on what you're selling is the shorter the answer is the better, right? Somebody who's in sales mode trying to persuade uh, like a, and, and really push the sale will usually go into a defensive spiral, especially on price, terms, contract, anything like that. Um, instead, I believe in super short answers. I believe in selling at a really effectively high level but operating almost like a DMV worker at times where it's like, Hey, it, it, tell me about your, you know, do you have a fee? Yes. That's it. It's yes or no. Right. Like, is, is, am I going to have to sign a contract if I sign up with you? Yes. It's a 12 month contract. And then I would go back. Like I'd keep it short. If they ask me a second time, then I'll go further. The third time I'll go even further. Um, but I believe in super yes and no. And then, you know, you can go that direction with the conversation if it's about fee or contract or just go back to where it was. I mean, I, in my brain, I think like, okay, this person interrupted me. They're very rude. I'm going to answer because it's polite. And I'm going to go back to where I was. Right. So if I'm talking about this over here, I'll say it, but I'm going to go back because I'm in control. And then the other thing that I do is if somebody asks the same question a couple of times, like it's a hot button item, let's say it's like a contract or a term or something like that. Then I'll ask them, I'll say, Hey, let me ask you, why is that? Why is that important to you? It's like the killer reversing. I call it empathetic reversing, but it's, it's turning it back on them, but not in a harsh way. But it's like, tell me about it. Like, why does that contract matter to you? Tell me about that. Cause I want to know. And a lot of times they'll say, I don't, I don't believe in contracts. I signed one before and I got burned and here's what happened. And then I have some kind of rebuttal to that. Now I found out some information. I can address that, tell them why we're different, tell them why they don't have a choice, work with them instead of just, you know, rambling about the terms or something like that. Mm -hmm. I like it. So you can kind of elicit the real objection behind the uh, objection. There always is, right? And I, I'm used to dealing with sales where I'm getting social security numbers, I'm getting banking information, I'm trying to help somebody financially. And so usually those things trigger people like I'm not giving you my social security number over the phone. And it's like, I totally get that. Tell me about that. And they're like, Yeah, I, you know, my aunt was a victim to fraud. Okay, great. Pull up your computer. Let me show you our BBB site. Let me show you this. Let me show you this. Let me show you this. Let me show you why we're the good guys and why this matters. Um, instead of just throwing that out there with a lot of salespeople do, they just instantly go to these other things. Just tell me like the real reason and then let's talk about it. Well, the next section of today's uh, episode here is sales in 60 seconds. So quick questions, quick answers with Jason Cutter. Uh, Jason, in your opinion, what is the most important component of selling with authentic persuasion? Um, for me, it's about understanding that it's your duty and responsibility as a sales professional to help other people. And when you make that shift, then you see yourself more as a professional, like a doctor who's helping people instead of something you're doing to other people. And that, that, changes, that changes most everything for a lot of salespeople. And what makes authentic persuasion so successful? Um, I think people want to buy from other humans and people need help. Again, if they didn't need your help, they would just order it online now. Everybody can order anything online. And so if they're talking to you, it's because they want some kind of help from a professional and they want to deal with a human, not a robot, not a slick salesperson. They want to deal with somebody who's authentic and there to persuade them and help them. People don't need knowledge anymore. People, people know more about you and your company and your product and your competition than you do. It's all in their hands. What they need is your wisdom. And if you can do that with authentic persuasion, that's what prospects are looking for the most. What would you say the biggest challenge is when it comes to selling with authentic persuasion? I think most people have a hard time in the beginning believing that that's the proper way, right? Because we're all taught or we all see 
and think what sales success looks like and what it takes to be successful. Hey, if I can show you how to save $500 by Friday, is this something you'd be interested in doing today? Like that kind of mode is what's perpetuated for a lot of salespeople. And they just don't believe, they don't believe that, Hey, if I'm just me and I do it because I care and I'm willing to push people the right direction and tell the wrong people no, that that will work. That's usually the hard part is getting sellers to trust that there is a, a way that that works. What's your top tip for using authentic persuasion to generate new business with existing customers? So I think the thing is, is that you've got to know the, the deepest level things from that empathy discovery probing phase, and then apply that in those upsell, resell, lifetime value extension kind of conversations. Um, if you don't know those questions, then you're just hoping or you're just, you have to start all over. But if I call you up and say, hey, Steve, I know we talked before, you had signed up. Hey, I've got this new thing. Yeah, I remember when we talked before, you would share this, this, and this. I'm thinking this would be a good fit for you. You came to mind. Then it's a done deal because now I'm an advisor who cares, remembers something about you, and I have something more that could help you. If you don't have that, you're gonna to have to do that phase all over again and just restart, it's fine. Ask questions, dig deep, and then just sell them like it's a brand new person following that framework. From your perspective, what are the characteristics of a successful salesperson? Um, like if we're looking at traits, being open and willing is a huge one. Um, there's a lot of salespeople who aren't open and willing. And it's really about wanting to learn more, being open to new ideas, and then also being open to feedback, right? Like professional athletes watch a lot of game footage so they can get better, right? They critique themselves, their coaches critique themselves. And so good salespeople listen to their calls, watch recordings of meetings, whatever it is, so that they can optimize and get better and just keep performing better, right? It's about having coaching. Um, and then they're curious, they're creative, they're persistent, and then they're authentic. Those are the five traits that I put. If you have those or you can keep working on those, you'll be successful in sales. And as an actionable takeaway, what should the field salespeople listening to today do as a first step towards getting started with selling with authentic persuasion? If we're talking about like actionable, like here's what they can do right now with this, mm -hmm. I would say the biggest thing is analyze how much time you're talking in your conversations and shift it as quickly as possible to asking more questions. One thing that will make a huge difference is if you just ask more questions and literally spend more time in the question asking phase. If you have a 30 minute meeting and you ask questions for 20 minutes, that's, that's a home run in my opinion because you, don't need, you won't need to sell much after that because it'll just be done. So that's one thing right away, ask more questions, listen more and, and focus on that part. All right, well, I'm gonna try to summarize um, some of the wisdom that you've given us today here. So first thought, authenticity in sales is all about using who you are, what makes you valuable, and what makes you strong in your sales role to help you sell. So care about your prospects and customers and be genuinely curious about what it is that they need. Ask questions and dig into what your prospects and customers really care about. Try to relate to a customer by thinking back to when you've been in their shoes or if you haven't ever experienced what they're experiencing, be, become a customer and try out the product yourself even if it's just you know in a pretend way because you actually wouldn't be a user of it or something, just go through that process and, and, and uh, learn to empathize with them. There's a lot of power in saying no. So when you've spoken with a prospect and you realize they're not a fit, don't be afraid to say no. It's, it's, uh, it's better off for everyone, or everyone's better off if you do that and this will stand out to them and they'll be more likely to refer you or keep you in mind in the future when they will be a better fit. Salespeople should think about their intentions before every sales call. So good intentions, you, you should aim to be helpful and to provide value to your prospects in every call. Authentic persuasion includes rapport, empathy, 
trust, hope, and urgency. Rapport is about finding some common things to talk about and making sure that you're interested, engaged, authentic. Um, empathy is focusing on the discovery phase, taking time to listen to what your prospect or customer is saying rather than thinking about what you're gonna be saying next. So really focusing in on the listening and putting yourself in their shoes. Rapport and empathy will help you build trust. Hope is helping, you, you have to get your prospect to see how you're gonna solve their problem. Urgency is your prospect needs to understand why they need to do this right now. So be authentic in understanding why they need it now and not why you need it now. Take time to understand who you're selling to and understand the pains and challenges that they experience. Then go through Jason's framework with some added tools like uh, one pagers and that describe things and, and, and uh, ROI calculators that can help show a customer why something is gonna benefit them and how much it's gonna benefit them and over what period of time. Intangibles can help you get an edge over your prospects. Um, use these intangibles to keep control over the conversation and even handle objections that your, your prospects may have. Jason, this has been some absolutely fantastic uh, wisdom for our listeners. Where, where can people read more about your work and how can they reach out to you going forward? Uh, thanks for that. The best place is jasoncutter.com. Uh, if you go there, it's a hub for all the different things that I have. There's a link for the book. If anyone wants to set up a time to chat with me and talk about sales and see if there's anything that I can do to help them with their sales process, there's a link in there. I'm also very active on LinkedIn and you can find me on there as well. Uh, when in doubt, you can Google me. I'm the number one ranked Jason Cutter on Google. So that's easy as well. Great. Well, Jason, I uh, appreciate you being here. And this has been an absolutely great episode of the Outside Sales Talk. If anyone can think of any other sales reps that would benefit from learning the skills that Jason has taught us here, uh, please forward this, this episode on to them. Take care until next time, everybody. And Jason, thanks for, thanks for coming out. Thanks for having me.